Judges 2, verses 1 through 5. Please listen carefully, for this is God's word. Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bacchum and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I would never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their God shall be a snare to you. So it was, when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voices and wept. Then they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. So ends the reading of the word. So the first thing that jumps out is Angel of the Lord. It's in capital A, Angel of the Lord, and that is the pre-incarnated Christ. And we're going to see the pre-incarnated Christ three or four times in Judges. But that's a, a, a signal that it's not just the regular angel, but angel of the Lord, meaning his deity. But here's the other thing that I just now when I read this. It says, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. Remember back in Exodus chapter 20 when the Lord's giving the Ten Commandments and he says, uh, uh, now that I've brought you out, of, well, I might as well go to it and read it. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. This is a wonderful picture of salvation. It says, And God spoke of these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So before he gives the Ten Commandments, he's saying, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I brought you out of the world, is what he's saying. Out of the house of bondage. Out of your sin. So he's saying, I took Marcia. I brought her out of this world. I regenerated her, opened her eyes, now she's able to receive the Ten Commandments. The same thing for everyone in this room. That's wonderful. And, and the Lord is reminding the people here, I am the one who led you up from Egypt and brought you to this land. I am the one who brought you out of the house of sin. I am the one that brought you out of the world. But here's the thing here, and we're going to see this, and it's a picture of us. But despite God's faithfulness to his covenant, he says, I've always been faithful to my covenant. The Israelites, us, have disobeyed his covenant stipulations for personal gain. Now, we have to be careful when we examine people's motives, obviously. We can't read people's heart, but God can. And you know what? It reminds me of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 12 and 13, it says, chapter three. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, who remains faithful? He cannot deny himself. A couple of things. I think it was yesterday or Friday, I did this study on endurance, which someday I'll bring it up. All the scriptures that talk about endurance. That's an aspect of saving faith. If you have saving faith, you will endure to the end. It's not Connie saying, I can do it, I can do it, I can endure to the end. And then if you do, you get a bonus, you get salvation. That's not what is happening. It's once you're born again, if you endure to the end, that means you're a true child of God. You have been since the time he justified you. But then he says, and there's many, many verses that, that I will bring up one day. And then he says, but if we deny him, he also would deny us. So that's different than being unfaithful. If we deny him, if you deny who Jesus Christ is, if you deny that he is the only one for salvation, if you deny him by walking in some other religion, he's going to deny you on judgment day. But then he says in verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. And that's beautiful. That's for us. And that's what's happening with judges here. 
if we are faithless, which we all are, anytime you fall into sin, you become faithless, he remains faithful because he knows we're sinners. We're his. We're his bride. He's not going to lose one. And so, he because he can't deny himself. That's what I told my mom last night. He cannot deny himself, meaning his word is on the line. If you are saved, you will be in heaven. He's not going to... How arrogant is that? to think that we can somehow undo salvation. That God is the one that works in us, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Beloved, if he ever, it's not 99% God and 1% us. It's 100% God. If he let you even have 1%, you'd mess it up, and you would not make it to the end. But beloved, because of this, now I'll go back to this, because of the people, what the Lord is saying, he's saying, you, you've broken my covenant for personal gain. He's not saying I disown you. He's saying I'm going to deal with your sin. And because of this, the Lord begins to withdraw his support, and he warns that the Canaanites, the one that they were supposed to drive out of the promised land, would lead the Israelites further astray into idolatry and moral compromise. That the Lord's only doing what's best for us. When he gives us these commandments. Now, I know we talked about the harem. That was only for a certain time when Israel was called out of Egypt and, and certain uh, nations inside the promised land. It's the only time it happened. We have no justification to practice any type of harem today. That was only then. Our spiritual principle that we glean from it I think, is he's talking about our sanctification. We're not going to be perfect, but he wants us to keep striving uh, to glorify him in our life. And so when he sees us starting to compromise our walk, he's a jealous God. He's a very jealous God. That's because he loves us. And he knows what's best for us, and he's going to put that pressure on us. And as a bride of Christ, which is what we are, we need to be faithful to his word. See, it's easy for our motives to be warped if we allow the world's influence to shape our relationship with God. And that is what's happening today in America, big time. If we we got to stay in the Word. This is a faithful church. One of the most faithful churches I've ever been associated with. We come here every Sunday. Many of you come Wednesday in Sunday school because we love the Lord. We made budget again this month. It's amazing for how small we are as a church. Make no mistake about it, we're the apple of his eye. Evergreen Baptist Fellowship is the apple of his eye. And since something happened to Colin's eye, we might as well say it. The eye is the most intimate part of the human body. I forget how you describe it, but Jesus says, you're, you're the, like an apple of, you're the, pupil of, of me. That's how much I love you. So he's a wonderful God and he blesses Evergreen Baptist Fellowship. But notice at the beginning of Judges 1 God acted on behalf of his people directly by giving them the land. He was with them. He told them how to do this. He said I will be with you. But when difficulties arose God sends what does he do? Out of his love he sends Caleb he sent Othniel, and he sent Othniel's wife, Aksah, to deliver them. See, he, he's never going to deny himself with us. Then in order to test them and teach them, because the Lord's always going to remain available to us. But what he does is maybe he doesn't act so transparent now towards us. When we first became Christians, we had a warm, fuzzy feeling all day long for a long time. We were like little babies learning how to walk. It's a wonderful thing. Don't you wish we could just stay that way the whole time? But we can't. Just like Peter, uh, not, yeah, Peter and John and James on the Mount Transfiguration, they wanted to stay up there. Let's make three tabernacles. We don't want this ever to end. But what the Holy One say? No, it's time for you to go down the mountain and get and get entangled with unbelief again because you're my witnesses. And that's how we grow. 
That's how we grow. And sometimes it seems like he's not there with us. Sometimes it seems like he's being unfair, maybe. He's sending this hard circumstance in our life. And then the next thing you know, and it, he does is out of grace, out of pure grace. Next thing you know, you're full of the Holy Spirit. You didn't ask for it. You just are. He knows the times when he has to withdraw his presence in order to teach us or convict us. And he knows when he fills us with the Holy Spirit. So, however... What's happening here, why I think the Israelites are being chastised here, because they're growing strong. You know, they didn't follow God's, all of his commandments. He left some of them there to be forced laborers. And they begin to rely now more on their strength to achieve their goals at the expense of their covenant obligations to God. And that's what we so easily it for us to fall into. When we have that great spiritual victory, or even human victory, we begin to start thinking we're all that. We begin to start thinking that maybe it's me that, that deserves the credit. And, and you know, again, the closer you come to the Lord, the more sin you're going to see in yourself. I'll get to that when we finish up. But look again at verses 1 through 3. It says... Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bacham and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land in which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their God shall be a snare to you. So ends the reading. So whatever the issue is, whatever the debate is, whatever you're facing every day, you know, the most important question that we can ask ourselves is, how does God view this? What is, how does God want me to look at this circumstance? You see, because many today, we got to admit this, many today, especially in the Western world, would argue, I've heard this I don't know how many times, would argue Israel was right here to avoid bloodshed, not to wipe out all the Canaanites like the Lord told them, to leave some there. I mean, after all, how can God really destroy an innocent people? How many times have you heard that? The problem is, of course, it's our human reasoning is what the problem is. And uh, let me remind you, our human reasoning is stained by sin. So our human reasoning is what's on trial, not God's morality. And so we need to remember Romans 3.10. Romans 3.10 says, There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 6.23, And the wages of sin is death. See, the Bible teaches that no one is innocent. But all are born sinners. You know, one thing I told my mom last night was, we're all going to die physically. For some reason, unless you're raptured out, but for some reason, God hasn't taken that away from us. The wages of sin is death. So the question is, do you have spiritual life or spiritual death? That's the question every human being has to ask themselves, because we're all going to die physically. But we need to marvel at God's mercies. Since we all deserve physical and spiritual death, we all deserve it. So peace at any cost is not biblical. Especially since Christ became a sacrifice and paid for our injustice. You see, God is a God of justice. He can't deny himself. Remember St. Timothy? He's a God of justice. He could, he could have said, Christ doesn't have to go to the cross. He could have just waved his hand and said, Ed, Shirley, Donna, you're, you're free. You're, you're, I forgive you. He can't do that or he'd deny himself because he is a God of justice. So Christ went to the cross and he paid for our injustice. If he paid for our injustice, don't you think he's going to make sure you make it to heaven? See, I think the problem we have 
is we think that because somebody confesses Christ, then you see him in the tavern the next day, or you see him not walking the life of Christ, you think, well, he must have lost his salvation. How do you, how do you know 1 John 2.19 is not in, in play here? Let me get 1 John 2.19. Again, we can't read anybody's motives, but here's something to think about. 1 John 2.19 says, They went out from us. Before I finish this verse, there's two different groups of people, they and us. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. Endurance. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us to begin with. But I digress. Israel's continued disobedience of not driving out the inhabitants of the land, but rather allowing them to stay by placing them under forced labor, provokes God to discipline his people. See, sanctification does not allow for partial obedience. I know, here we go again. It's not easy being a Christian. You know why it's not easy being a Christian? It's not that... It's not that Frank has to say, I can do it, I, 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 I got to obey, I, I got to obey or I'm going to lose my salvation. It's because we're born again, we're of the Spirit, we have a new nature. One thing I'm going to mention next week in the Trinity, it's not, it's three persons, but it's one will of the same essence. It's not three different wills, it's one will. And so... And all three of them are involved in the salvation process. So it's easy for us, at least for me, and if it's easy for me, I know it's easy for you guys. We're, we're going to be honest here. It's easy for us to justify a favorite habit of sin. See, I hate saying this because this just puts a target right on me. It's easy for us to justify a favorite habit of sin and then judge ourselves as making good progress and other areas of our spiritual life. Don't we do that? And what happens is in becoming covenant makers with the Canaanites or becoming covenant makers with the woke agenda or the world, we actually become covenant breakers with the Lord who brought them out of Egypt. And remember what Egypt stands for, who brought them out of the world. See, when we don't speak up, maybe, we got to be careful here, because Christians, I don't think, in my opinion, shouldn't be involved in politics and have their identity as politics. It should be more about your identity as Christ. But there's nothing wrong with following politics, I'm not saying. You don't, there's a difference between politics and being a Christian. If you, you know, your identity is a Christian. And so when we don't speak up about the moral wrongs, though, in our culture, we become unfaithful to the Lord. But we don't, it's going to be hard. It's going to be even harder. I watched some today on TV, matter of fact, where I came in here, a Lutheran pastor who was talking to somebody, and he said, um, uh, what did he say? Now I forget. If I just blurt something out during the rest of this, you'll know I can remember what he said. But second, uh, Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18, says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belli? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, and as God has said, I would dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So ends the word. So, we have to be careful here because we're here to witness to non-believers. But there's a fine line there that you don't want to be a, you don't want to be identified as a as a non-believer. Maybe is what 
maybe is a way of saying it. We're, we're, we don't want to be a little group off to the side. We got to influence the culture. But at the same time, you have to you, you, you have to stand up for what for God's word. You have to stand up for what it is to be a Christian, even if people are going to joke about you, mock you, and say all kind of things about you. You don't hate anybody. You still fellowship with them, and if you know what I mean. But you don't compromise your walk, and that's what how God perceives Israelites by allowing the Canaanites to stay in the land. He's saying you're not fully following me is what he's saying but here's the first time that we meet the angel of the Lord he's going to appear again in 523 in 611 and in 133 he appears to to uh, Gideon Christ does he appears to Samson's parents some of my favorite verses in the Bible when he appears to Samson's mother Christ, all through the Old Testament, at times, appears as either a human being or maybe an angel. But it's the pre-incarnated Christ. He doesn't give up his deity. You know, in Joshua, let me say this, Joshua chapter 5, this is important. 13, that, notice uh, what it says in John, uh, Joshua chapter 5, 13 through 15. And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man, and the man is capitalized, stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. Worshipped. And said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Remember when that phrase came in the first time? It was in uh, Exodus chapter 3, when Moses went to the burning bush. And God, and it says in Acts chapter 3, Five or 7, Acts chapter 7, around verses 35 through 38, it was Jesus Christ himself speaking to Moses from the burning bush. It literally says that in the book of Acts. It also says in, the, in uh, Jude, it was literally Yeshua, literally, in the Greek it says it was Jesus who delivered them from Egypt in Jude. But I digress. But here... Moses goes to the burning bush, and what does the Lord say to him from the bush? Take your sandals off, for the place where you stand is holy ground. He's saying the same thing to Joshua. And so now it's judges where the Lord Jesus appears. But verses 4 and 5 says, So it is when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voices and wept. Then they called the name of the place Bachem, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. So ends the reading. You know what just popped in my mind? So when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel, it reminds me of when Peter denied Christ, and the Lord looked at Peter, and it broke him. Remember when he's sitting around that fire and he denied Christ three times and Jesus looked at him? See, Jesus has a way. He knows what it's going to take to grant repentance to us. He does. He knows what he has to say to us. He knows what circumstance he has to bring in, the pressure he has to put on each one of us. Because again, he's not going to lose any of us. And, he, and beloved, he, he is, he, and he's a jealous God. He's going to keep you going. As one pastor said I watched on TV yesterday, it's like you go three steps forward, maybe five steps back, and then four steps forward. You're always progressing further. But as Israel hears the consequences of their disobedience, I'm not going to drive them out anymore, they express their sorrow by weeping and sacrifices. So we have to ask, what marks true repentance for you? See, there's, there's no clear indication 
whether their sorrow maybe is only the result of their disappointment. This is what we call a worldly repentance. Or maybe fear of consequences or anticipated trouble. Or is it really godly repentance that God grants us? And we go back to Sanket, uh, Sanket Corinthians chapter 7 now, verse 9 through 11. This is the difference between a godly repentance and a worldly repentance. Judas had a worldly repentance. He hung himself. He was, he was sorry because it didn't go the way he thought it was going to go. He didn't have a true godly repentance that Christ is the one he sinned against. Because you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting at verse 9 through 11. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For if you were made sorry in a godly manner, then you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What feminine desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. That's godly repentance. Godly repentance says, I hate sin. I hate what I've done to my beloved Savior. I hate how I made him look as my witness. That's a godly repentance that you want to you want to change. You want to grow in your sanctification. God often allows us, though, to be ensnared in our own foolishness. He knows how many. He knows how long he has to let Mary Jo wall around in this sin. How long he has to let Charlie do it. How long he has to have me wall around in this sin until we hate it until we are disgusted with it. And then we come and he grants us that repentance. We need to learn how bitter sin is. We need to learn its lasting consequences. So we should never be satisfied with an incomplete conquest like it seems Israel was. Well, we, we, we drove out most of them, but not all of them. We should never be satisfied with our sanctification until we get to heaven. See, the situation we see Israel did not come about suddenly. God is still giving them a chance to repent, but rather is a result of a slow process that began with one act of compromise. God told me to drive all these people out, but I didn't. And I started getting comfortable, started relying on my own strength. So, you know, doing something that maybe is inconsistent with being faithful to God always is made to be sound reasonable to us. We can, so in other words, doing something inconsistent should be sin. You should fall into sin not as a lifestyle, but inconsistently. But what happens sometimes when we're starting to fall away is we, we, we do a, a good act for God, but it's inconsistent. And we, we chalk it up as, look at how good I was today, but we don't deal with the sin that he's trying to convict us with. So we're exhorted in the book of Judges and the rest of Scripture to keep God as a primary actor in our lives and ministries. See, it's very easy to rely on to rely on human wealth, to rely on our own wisdom, maybe our own personality, and our own strength rather than the Lord when we're seeking to extend God's kingdom here on earth. Have you noticed, I'll just finish with this, have you noticed that God uses unlikely people throughout uh, the history of redemption? And why is that? Because God, because such people realize their need for God, and so they tap into his immeasurable resources. Unlike the strong in the world who think their own human resources are adequate. See, God wants us to come to the end of ourselves is what Paul says. He's glorified through our weakness. 
And, and you see, Jesus loves us so much. His desire from the Garden of Eden until the end of Revelation is to communicate with his people throughout the ages. You know, he conversed regularly with Adam and Eve in the Garden. He was even such a good God, he gave them boundaries. Do not transgress this boundary. So commandments are not evil. And then they disobeyed. And what did the Lord do? He sought them out. He sought them out. And even when they got banished from the garden, the Lord still revealed a passionate desire for communication. He even confronted Cain over his murderous action. God is always speaking to us, be it through his word, through circumstances. He's always speaking to us. He directly spoke to Noah, right? And, and, and gave Noah his intention of bringing judgment on the earth. And then he promised to establish a covenant with his family. Jesus, and it is Jesus, because remember when he says to, in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus breaks into history in Genesis 12 and to set in motion a, a redemptive plan through Abraham and his descendants, offering blessing and hope to all nations. He loves to speak and commune with his people. He's never going to deny you. I promise you that. One last thing, give me 30 seconds. I talked about spiritual leadership for a few minutes last week. You know what? And it doesn't have to be spiritual leadership. It just be our walk with God. Look at the people that, that glorified God when they were called to be leaders. Because they completely relied on Jesus. The stuttering Moses, remember? He could have been, don't send somebody else. I can't even speak well. The deceitful Jacob. That's like my mom said, who are these people in Genesis? The youthful David. Remember, the, the brothers didn't even have him come with the other brothers. But he has one left. He's just a young guy out there taking care of the sheep. The denying Peter he used. And the murderous Paul he used. 